um, it's really three, three of us who are uh, the, probably some of the more active members of, the, of our active travel forum in Bolton. Um, really got interested in, in looking at, um, at some of the things that already exist in Bolton that uh, we don't generally tend to think about. Um, myself, Graham Cooper, I'm just a retired troublemaker in Bolton. I run the Active Travel Forum. Mike Hutton uh, lives in West Horton and he, he's done quite a bit of work in West Horton. He, he helped us with that, uh, that side of things out on the, the far west of the borough. Uh, and Shan Wilkinson is, um, is, the, is the professional among us. She actually uh, works in public health, but um, is uh, doing this in her spare time. So I just want to start by uh, putting up a quotation. The freedom with which a person can walk about and look around is a very useful guide to the civilized quality of an urban area. Judged against this standard, many of our towns now seem to leave a great deal to be desired. There must be areas of good environment where people can work, shop, look about and move around on foot in a reasonable freedom from the hazards of motor traffic. So that's very relevant for, uh, for today. I'm not going to say where that came from. I'll, I'll come back to that at the end. So I think you're all familiar about with the um, with the the debate you might call it I should put that in inverted commas on low traffic neighbourhoods or, or filtered neighbourhoods or as we like to call them around here active neighbourhoods. Um, they tend to be residential streets or areas with residential streets where there's a lot of rat running and you're trying to eliminate motor traffic by uh, by uh, through traffic rather by uh, putting in some kind of barrier that makes it permeable to walking and cycling but not to motor vehicles. And they seem to be causing a lot of strong feelings. We've got a, a consultation just started here about a small um, active neighbourhood that, uh, that is hopefully going to go ahead. And already there's backlash and people threatening to vandalise whatever is put in place and stuff like that. Not much, but, uh, but it's only just gone up. Um, so the sorts of things, um, sorts of objections we see are things to do with uh, the unfairness of pushing traffic from some roads onto other roads, particularly at the boundary of the, um, of the, the low traffic neighbourhood. Um, problems that are uh, asserted with gentrification, you make an area nice, the property prices go up and the locals get pushed out. There are some issues with that, as we'll see uh, later in the talk. Um, emergency services, deliveries, disabled access and all of that sort of thing, which tends to be, uh, be mostly not true, actually. You talk to the emergency services and they're perfectly happy with, uh, with most of these schemes. And then the one that often comes up, we are not wealth and forest. This is Bolton. We're different. We're unique in all the world. And you do see that everywhere you see that. And so the result is you get vandalism. Um, and the, uh, the picture on the right is actually from a video that somebody posted of themselves pushing a planter out of the way with their car. Um, so hopefully that was passed on to the police and, uh, and some action was taken. But the good thing about that is that you also see that that sort of vandalism sort of makes the, um, the, the silent majority start to take notice of what's going on. And here we've got those same planters have been reinstated by... Uh, by people who live in the area. So there's all this, it's almost, in certain places, it's almost like a war over this new fangled thing called a, a low traffic neighbourhood. But we sort of asked the question, are they really new? And this sort of came up for me um, earlier in the year when, um, when I was walking with my wife in uh, Halliwell, part of Bolton. And I noticed some continuous footways. And I'd actually seen some of those continuous footways on another road in the same area as I, I used to cycle past um, and I, I, it sort of reminded me that Shan had mentioned some time ago that she thought she'd found an active neighborhood and I'd put that to the back of my mind but when we were there I thought oh let's look into this um, and sure enough um, it, it is an active neighborhood I mean it has rat runs through it still Shepherd Cross Street there which is the thing from the bottom to the top that tends to be a rat run but how old is this how long has it been in there well, that's one of the, uh, the modal filters and some of the, um, the continuous footways. And I don't think that was put in there recently. And actually, I'd like to see the vandals try to move that one. That would be, would be interesting to see. So early in December, um, I also heard that uh, somebody at TFGM, Transport for Greater Manchester, was, was actually looking at existing modal filters, streets that have been filtered, to try and get um, interviews with the people that lived on those streets to see what their experiences were. And that sort of got me thinking about, well, I wonder how many of these there are in Bolton. We know of 
a few, you know, you walk around, you sort of are familiar that certain roads are blocked off to motor vehicles, but you never really know how extensive that is. Um, and so we got, um, I started, I created a Google map and uh, we started looking at Google Street View. Um, and we set up this map where, where we record, started recording where these things are. Um, we include things like ginnels and that sort of thing where it's actually been designed in. So there are different kinds of these. Uh, we also record whether it's a retrofit. Is it something that was originally designed in or was it a street that has now been blocked off to motor traffic for one reason or another? Is it cycle friendly? And unfortunately, most of them aren't. Uh, not most of them. Uh, uh, probably the majority of them are, but, but quite a few are cycle friendly. And we also started put a, to put a street view link into there. And we ended up with quite a lot of these. And this is looking at the, uh, the map as retrofit, retrofit versus as built. So the one with the work, worker there is, uh, is a retrofit one. The star ones are as built. And also whether they're cycle friendly, um, there's a picture of a person walking if it's not and a, a cycle if it is, um, but that's not the best way to represent this. So more recently we pulled this into, into QGIS and, and produced a more, more detailed map. And you can see uh, now that we actually have found 911 of those across the borough. This is a borough with um, just under 300,000 people. So that's the, the size of the, of the space. Uh, retrofit ones, 343. So 343 places in the borough that were previously accessible to motor vehicles have at some point been blocked off and filtered so that only walking and cycling is, is, is possible. Um, probably about twice as many uh, walking as there are cycle friendly. And then there's a whole lot of other stuff which is, uh, was built like that areas that were actually built with permeability for walking and cycling in mind. And some examples here, we've got uh, cycle friendly as built ones. That's what we call a ginnel in this part of the world anyway. Um, here are some, that, that may have been a street at some time, but we, we're calling that as built because uh, we're pretty sure that was built as part of the newish development that's sort of behind the camera there. Another one, which is in the middle of a, of a relatively new development. Um, this one at the bottom right, um, I think that's probably fair to say that as the stuff behind the camera is fairly new and the stuff there is quite old, it's probably retrofit from the other side and as built from this side. And the one in the middle there uh, on the right, that probably was a farm track at one time before the housing was built in that, um, that location. We're going to have a look at that location in a bit more detail. The as-built ones, well, some of them are obviously, it's obvious why they're not cycle friendly, that's walking only, and they're not pram friendly or wheelchair friendly either, but that's, that's a good reason. It's pretty hilly in Bolton if you go off the main roads. Uh, but quite a few of them are, um, are areas where the, there's permeability has been built into the, into the place, um, and it's just a shame that there weren't drop curbs put in there. Um, here's another one on the le bottom left where it, what it's, a, it's a, a path through some allotments. It's about three metres wide if you cut back the vegetation to, to, to the boundaries. Um, and unfortunately, those barriers are put in so you can't get through on a bike, but it's really heavily used by people walking. This one is also very annoying because um, uh, it actually is the place where you access the Bolton branch of National Cycle Route 55, and it's not cycle friendly. Uh, and the, this one amuses me a bit because they've even had to put more bollards in later to stop people driving through the field to get past, which is uh, it's incredible sort of thing you see. And then looking at the retrofit ones, well, that one's very well known. That's in the centre of Bolton. Anybody who's watched Peaky Blinders or any of the other things that have been filmed in Bolton will have seen that. Uh, but there are all sorts. Some are just bollards. Some are continuous footways with bollards and curbs. But there they're provided a way through for, for cycles. Some are gardens and trees and plants and so on, but again, they've put drop curbs in and there's a drop curb on the other side, so cycles can get through as well as uh, people on foot. And some are actually whole streets that have been pedestrianised. And this is where it, it does get quite interesting. We'll come back to that a bit later. Of the walking only ones, similarly, retrofit. Um, this was a horrendous rat run. Um, which is in an area where we're currently looking at another active neighbourhood scheme. Uh, the, the consultation on that went, um, went live, I think, in the last couple of days. Uh, but that was filtered a long time ago to stop people uh, rat running to avoid a very busy junction. Um, that is actually in a, in a, in a similar location. 
Um, it's a different rat run, but for the same, exactly the same purpose. Here's one of the light because there's an active traveler there. If it were a bit more cycle friendly, she could actually carry a lot more shopping on a cargo bike. Again, um, these whole streets pedestrianized. And here's one that, uh, that has, um, it's gone the whole hog with trees and grass and everything. Well, that used to be a, a through route uh, to here. There is actually a route through an underpass that goes underneath the bypass into the town centre on the right there. And actually this will form part of the Bolton Town Centre East B network scheme. So we looked at these, these are just some examples, there are all sorts of, of different ones, um, but we also noticed that in a lot of areas there are clusters of filter permeability. So here we've got a cluster of um, as-built cases, and here if we look at these with the uh, lines on, these are mostly retrofit, and we can see that you start to see active neighbourhoods that already exist, low traffic neighbourhoods, um, if you live um, away from this area. Um, and so we started to look in more detail at those and, uh, and explore the areas either through Google Street Level or actually by going there and cycling and walking. And we found, I think, 18 of these or 19 of these so far distributed across the borough. So when people start arguing about low traffic neighbourhoods, they're already there, they're everywhere. And some of these are really there as low traffic neighbourhoods in the sense that we understand uh, now. So just looking at some of these, some of them are clearly built with active travel in mind in the first place. And there's a reason for that, which Shan will talk about uh, in a little while. Some of them are clearly retrofit. So that area there is retrofit. And this area is very interesting. Uh, but you can see that, um, that a lot of, uh, of filters are put in on the boundaries of this area. And um, what I want to do is to just look very quickly at two uh, examples of this because they're in there for seem to be in there for very different reasons. The first one is uh, what I've what we've called Castle Street Active Neighbourhood just because Castle Street runs through the middle of it um, and the reason it's it's a nice quiet area to uh, to move around because of these modal filters on the boundary and that one at the top there. Now if you look at those I've just taken the street that uh, I'll just go back there if I take that that road which is a, a very busy uh, road in the uh, in the borough. Uh, if we just turn that up, then this model filter here looks like that, and that is a street view picture from 2009. And even at that stage, these trees were starting to get mature. So that's obviously been there for quite a long time. But if we look at the two in the top there, this one, if we look at that one, that's Radcliffe Road goes across there all the way over. You can see this was actually installed in 2017, July 2017. In April 2017, it looked like that. By the following year, it looked like that. And the reason that's in there is because some work was done on this main road here, partly to try and reduce the number of uh, collisions and people getting injured on that road, which was a, a collision hotspot, uh, but also because this road was being upgraded. And um, you can see that introducing that filter there has removed some traffic movements, which would have blocked this main road. So the right turn there has been eliminated. They also made that, that road, which is also Radcliffe Road, one way. So the right turn there has been eliminated. So that smooths the traffic flow on this main road. However, the side effect of that has been to make this a very nice area to, uh, to, to walk and cycle. It's really quiet and, and pleasant. So that's the first one. Now, this, that, and that I think is more of a sort of accidental active neighbourhood because it's a result of trying to to, uh, to improve flows on a main road. This one is a bit different. This is uh, is near Astley Bridge, an area called Sharples, and um, that's the area. And you can see there's a mixture of as-built and retrofit modal filters in there. And just looking more closely at that, we can see what that area looks like if you just remove the modal filters. Now it's actually located between Belmont Road which is a fairly busy main road. It was originally the route that you would take from this side of Bolton to Preston and areas over there. Um, it's to some extent been superseded by the M61 but it still is a fairly busy route. Blackburn Road is one of the busiest roads in the borough and this junction at the bottom here on the right is uh, Astley Bridge Junction and that is one of the most 
busy junctions and most congested junctions in the borough. It has dreadful figures for air quality and something needs to be done about it. Now that means there's a massive incentive for rat running between these two roads. If you've got to go down there, you'll get into the congestion uh, before you can start to get up there. So you can see where the rat runs might, might be if you didn't actually do something about it. Now, just a little bit of the, the history of this. This is really old terrace streets. This is relative, this is newer mixture of terrace streets and some, um, some semi-detached sort of things, a bit newer. So as you move out away from the town centre, it's getting newer and newer. And this part up in the top left is probably about 20 years old. This part was there before that part. So let's start to have a look at what's been done with that particular uh, set of rat runs. Here we've got the joint between an older estate, relatively a modern but older estate, and the Temple Coombe estate, which is the new one. And obviously people here didn't want people who are coming into that new estate from rat running through that street. So it's been blocked off and there are two modal filters there. I'll come back to why I think there are two. Uh, the higher res engineers will probably already know why, but I have a, a theory about that. And then the other one is if even if you have to go up to Temple Coombe Drive, you can still rat run through there. But another modal filter was put in there at some time. And obviously they've had to put some uh, rubbish bins in there to stop people driving around it on the, on the footways. So that's eliminated that rat run. And if we go further down to the older streets, then you can start to see there are a lot of potential rat runs through there. Um, and one of them is this route, which would take you between the two there. And that was filtered a long time ago. These are rusty old posts and it's all overgrown now. But that was at one time a through route from here all the way through to, um, uh, to this road here. Um, that filter has been put in, just some bollards stuck in the road. That's actually a back street, but it would form um, another rat run. And in addition to that, this road here has been made one way leading away from the centre of the, of the area. And that is also one way leading away from the centre of the area. Now, it, it's, that, that does eliminate a through route there as well. Although residents on this street have been reporting that a lot of people actually drive the wrong way down that one way street. And then this is one that I really like. Um, this is on the main road. It's a really nice leafy uh, thing. It's again got the two modal filters, but it has drop curbs, so it's accessible to, to cycles, but it also pre prevents that rat run. However, I think that one is possibly older and was put in there to stop right turns from the main road, which would have delayed traffic on this very, very busy road. So people have to go further on and follow that route round. So um, again, a mixture of, uh, of reasons for these. Okay, so, so that's um, looking at that, that second one is, is what I would really call an active neighborhood. It's really a classic rat run situation and filters have been put in to stop people rat running and make that a nice place for people to live. So when we look at uh, this data in QGIS, that gives us a lot of analysis potential. And I'm not gonna go into the detail of analysis, but the sorts of things we can do is put this on top of population density. We can put it on top of how many car-free households there are. Um, the brightest green in that picture are areas where 60 to 66% of households don't have access to a car or van. Um, and you can start to see some correlations and not causation necessarily, but some correlations. Uh, multiple dep deprivation index, it was mentioned earlier in Bob's talk that, um, uh, that uh, the majority of low traffic neighbourhoods are in areas where there's, where there's high def deprivation. So we can look at that sort of thing. And we can also put these on top of things like the B network proposals. This is TFGM's map of the B network. Um, so we can start to see where there might be useful routes in neighbourhoods that give access to the new routes that are being proposed. Similarly, when the safe streets um, uh, uh, consultations were done in uh, at the beginning of the, the first lockdown, um, first COVID lockdown, uh, we did some analysis and came up with a, a proposed set of key routes that might be useful uh, to have. Uh, and that did actually go into uh, feed into the, um, uh, the tranche one and tranche two um, in, uh, active travel fund proposals that have gone in from Bolton. And so again, you can start to see how routes might feed into those. So that's, I've talked a bit about the, uh, about the what and some of the how. 
Shan has been doing a lot more digging though into the why. Why are these things here? It's quite a lot of filter permeability across the borough. So why are they there? So if Shan wants to just take over. Okay, does anyone hear me all right? Yeah, seem to be. Okay, so thanks to some photos on the Bolton Library and Museum Archive, um, these are the ones that we've identified that are general improvement areas. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Now, can I have the next slide, please, Graham? Okay, so I've got this quote because I thought it kind of summarised the policy quite well from the Minister of Housing and Local Government, Mr. Anthony Greenwood, on the 10th of February 1969. We want improvement of houses to take place more in whole areas than it has done up till now, and not just in scattered houses. The environment can make or mar the quality of life in an area and can enhance or diminish the value of the houses there. That is why we are proposing, for the first time, grants for environmental improvement. But here let me beg for a realistic outlook. We have not enough money to turn all our older areas into the hanging gardens of Babylon. At this stage, I shall simply stress how much can be achieved by providing playgrounds and open spaces with a few seats, by stopping through traffic, by improving the pavements and street furniture, and by planting trees and flower beds, and all for a fairly modest expenditure. Can the next slide, please? <coughs> okay, so I thought it's kind of interesting to note with this that it's a housing policy. It, the main aim of it was to improve unfit properties. At the time, it was the main alternative was clearance of these properties, but then there was growing re resident um, opposition to that. So the environmental improvements were designed to encourage uptake of grants to improve the properties so that they didn't need to be demolished and that they could have new life um, continuing into the future. The idea was to give people confidence in the future of the area and to encourage them to contribute their own money for it. For the environmental improvements, there was also a government, a central government contribution to paying for them. Um, I've kind of converted it into modern money there. Um, but also local authorities were putting their own money towards that. And next slide, please. So these are the improvements that were permitted to be spent and to be eligible for the central government contribution. So the street works is mostly what we'd be thinking of if put in place if it was an active neighbourhood today. But there's also other interventions that are about making it a nicer place to be, um, particularly the landscape and the community facilities and the sort of prettying up of the buildings. It wasn't about structural changes. It was about sort of prettying them up, really. Next step, please. Uh, next slide, please. So it's worth comparing what interventions were funded with the idea of environmental areas that was in the Buchanan report from 1963. So that's also known as traffic in towns, and it was commissioned by the Ministry of Transport. Uh, you might have heard of it, but basically it was about adapting urban areas to cope with the increase in motor traffic that had already been seen and was predicted to increase even further. So in terms of traffic management, this is the main document that councils would have been working at in the time in 1969 when this policy was introduced. Um, there's, there's similarity in the interventions that we've put in in the environmental areas as that is in what in what's in the general improvement area. So the idea was balancing the place and the movement function. Um, so all the roads in the borough, there'll be some that would be allocated as to more to be towards movement. So they're the main roads that in the Buchanan report, they're not very nice to walk or cycle down. But anyway, the environmental areas were places where the place function dominated. So in this terms, we've got he quoted, an area that had a good environment in this sense would be one that, as far as traffic is concerned, is quiet, safe, clean, uncluttered by cars and safe for children. He also considered parked cars to be um, a bad thing as well because they were providing visual intrusion. When I get to the photos, you'll be able to see that we don't, we don't seem to consider that quite so much today. Uh, next slide, please. So I've got some photos after, but I'll just go through the legacy because everyone has a photo. So. There was widespread backing and all party support for this approach. It was popular. It, it prevented the decline and deterioration of older housing. It kept communities together because the areas that were cleared, they tend to scatter the communities and people obviously didn't like that. It was also cheaper than clearance and rebuilding, always important. And so by the early 1970s, councils were doing at least as much improvement as clearance and possibly more. One of the main issues was that it was never intended to target the very worst areas. And the next housing act, 
that was in 1974 introduced housing action areas. So they were looking at areas where the, the housing was in worse quality than what it was in these areas, but also experienced multiple deprivation on top of that. But these didn't replace the general improvement areas. They ran alongside them and also alongside clearance areas. The, originally, the idea of it was that it was just about encouraging people to take up grants and loans, but it was found that compulsory improve, improvements were needed alongside this. There was a particular issue with absentee landlords who weren't willing to make improvements for their tenants. And that leads on to the next point about gentrification, especially an issue in London, but this was an issue where uh, the landlord would take a grant, use it on an unoccupied property, um, and then sell it on for a profit or raise the rent. So it was generally acknowledged that this po policy was more effective in areas where there were lots of owner occupiers. Um, the the uh, size of these areas wasn't particularly set out. There was quite a lot of freedom for councils to decide what they did and where they did it, um, but intended to be areas that were around 300 houses. So the suggestion is that maybe this was a little bit too small to really have a big impact. The environmental areas, as I said, that's the approach that councils were wanting to take anyway. And those that did happen tended to mostly happen under general improvement areas, probably because of the uh, central government grants that were available, I would suggest. So between 1969 and 1973, there are about 900 general improvement areas declared in the UK. So it's quite likely that you have some in your area, particularly if you've got a lot of older housing in your area. And the environmental improvements were a very common element of them. So I've put in about resident engagement because it compares quite interestingly to with the um, active travel fund requirements. So there was community objection to clearance, and that's kind of one of the reasons why this was introduced in the first place. So when the general improvement areas were introduced, there was was some requirement for resident consultation, but it was more kind of after the area was declared and that they could, that they were notified and they could make representations. But at a similar kind of time, there was a general planning report in 1969 as well, that was about strengthening public engagement in all matters of planning. So in some areas, the general improvement areas proved a test bed for this new approach. And it seems in those areas where they did consult meaningfully and widely, it was quite important, like in a sort of make or break terms of how successful the scheme was. So in 1973, then there was circulars issued about the importance of residents' engagement in the new and upcoming general improvement areas. And it was also strengthened and required at an earlier stage when the housing action areas were introduced. And 50 years on, they, the bottom ones at least, they are mostly still there. So let's go to the next slide and you can have a look at what they're looking like. So yeah, this is an example of some paving works, uh, same spot. There's quite a lot of this red paving in the bottom ones. Um, it seems it was about providing kind of variety, visual variety, and also setting out a difference in the areas for people and the areas for cars. But if you look at the one on the left, there's still a bit of pavement parking going on even in the 70s. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there we've got a road closed to motor traffic and this is off the archive we can see before and after in the same spot and there's the kids playing and there's a lovely little video um there's more kids playing in the video uh, next slide please so these two show where it was um maybe a back alleyway or something but it was originally a road completely all the way through that's been closed off to motor traffic and on the one on the left you can see it looks like it maybe used to be trees that were doing the closing off, but it's bollards now. Um, but you can see how the red paving continues across the road. And when I went for a walk down there, it did, I did actually get a car given way to me across there. So I that was quite good. And then in the right, it looks like it, there's ornamental paving there. So it looks like it's been refreshed kind of a bit more recently. Next slide, please. Um, so parking blocks were something that was introduced as well under this. So on the left, you've got garages, but then on the right, you can see that the garages have gone, the house has gone, and it's been replaced by a flatbed car park um, for residents, but there's still people parking in the street. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so tree and shrub planting, um, there you can see on the left when they've just been put in, and they had new street lights as well. There's new, new street lights now, but the uh, trees and shrubs, a lot of them still there. Next slide, please. Oh, yeah, and I like this one. This was out of the Bolton News. Um, 
about Mrs Thorpe, who no longer has to look at flagstones, parked cars and litter, and she can tend the flowers outside her house, which is very nice. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so there's some more tree and shrub planting. Um, same spot again. On the right, it looks like someone's removed one of the bollards uh, to let them park right in front of the house. Um, but again, mostly still there. Next slide, please. So the ones in bottom, they tend to, there are still some through routes through them. So they tend to do it by putting in one way systems so that it's the long straight roads where people can pick up traffic. They're not there so much. So in the left hand one, you can see a planter there blocking off what would have been a straight on route. So people have to turn left. And then on the right, the trees, I quite like these because this is quite a long straight street, but you can see that the trees are partially planted in the road. So um, it slows the traffic speed. And next slide, please. And there's some play areas as well, which is nice. Old, still there in the new photo. And next slide, please. Okay, so um, some conclusions, we'll not, uh, not dwell on these, but I think it's worth picking out a, a couple of things. One is that the fairness objections about moving traffic onto, um, plows onto main roads, boundary roads, that is sometimes true, but actually uh, it also often isn't true. And in fact, often the opposite is the case because uh, filtering side streets actually makes flows um, on main roads simpler and, um, and probably smoother. Gentrifications, well, that can be studied because it's been, uh, it's been um, experienced before. And it's worth looking at how the politics have changed since then. We've got valuable information for our B network planning. So uh, we might want to look back at, um, at some of that. And it's also possible to study um, uh, the, the various impacts of, of these schemes, uh, just looking back. We don't have to wait for them to be put in and then, and then investigate them. We can actually look back. Okay, so I just want to go back to that, um, that quotation that I, I put up at the beginning. That was actually from Colin Buchanan in the uh, Traffic in Towns uh, report in 1963. So this stuff's been known about for a long time. Now in 1963, I had my sixth birthday. Uh, the Beatles hit the big time with their first three number one hits. The Beeching Report was published, which started decimating the railways and helped to bake car dependence into our whole culture. And Colin Buchanan in that year wrote this about the motor car. Given its head, it would wreck our towns within a decade. The problems of traffic are crowding in upon us with desperate urgency. Unless steps are taken, the motor vehicle will defeat its own utility and bring about a disastrous degradation of the surroundings for living. Either the utility of vehicles in town will decline rapidly or the pleasantness and safety of surroundings will deteriorate catastrophically. In all probability, both will happen. So we'll leave you with that.